Section 1 You will hear a woman, called Tanya, talking to her friend, called Simon, who lives abroad. Tanya is planning to visit Simon. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Hello? Hi, is that Tanya? Yes, Simon. Lovely to hear you. How are you? Very well, and we're so looking forward to seeing you. So am I. Now, I don't have a lot of time, I'm afraid, so I wanted to make sure we've got all your details. Have you confirmed your flights? Yes, I'm definitely coming on the 22nd of June. Excellent. Have you got your flight number? Not with me, I'm afraid, but I promise I'll email it. Let me make a note of all this. Yes, do, because one of us will try to come and collect you from the airport, if we can. I presume you'll be coming into Terminal 1? Uh, I don't know. I'll have to find out which one it is. Yes, you must. <laughs> we don't want to be waiting at the wrong one. But hang on. I'll be arriving at about lunchtime, and that'll mean you have to take time off work to pick me up. You really mustn't do that. Look, we're not all that busy at work, and if there's a problem, I can text you when you arrive, and you can take a taxi. OK. There's a really good company called Pantera. Can you spell that? It's P-A-N-T-E-R-A. -E they have a stand at the airport. You can't miss it, and they're really reliable. Great, thanks. How far are you from the airport? About 40 minutes. And you're near the city centre, aren't you? We're east of it, actually. Uh, don't tell the driver city centre, because you'll really get caught up in traffic. OK. And I'll make sure I carry your address with me. Now, have you got my mobile uh, cell phone number? Yes. You sent it last month. But I tell you what, I don't think I've got yours. I'd better have it now, just in case. OK. And I changed it recently anyway. Ready? It's 07765-328-4000. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Thanks. Now, what should I pack? Well, all the usual. Casual clothes, mainly. Though you'd better bring an evening dress. We'll be having at least one fancy dinner in a hotel restaurant. OK, now, when you're coming, unfortunately the weather is not going to be brilliant. I know. It's the rainy season. I'm bringing an umbrella. Uh, we have tons of those, so don't pack one. But pack a raincoat, a good one, because we'll try and get out for plenty of hikes. OK, sure. Sounds super. Just what I love. And I'd better remember to pack my sturdy walking shoes. Excellent idea. It's pretty rugged round here, so they have to be tough. I can imagine. I'm so looking forward to getting out. Oh, Simon. Before I forget, you recommended I read a book about your area. Yeah. What was the name again? I'd like to read it, to get an idea of the history, etc. 
It's called Mountain Lives, and it's. Hang on, I'm just writing it down. Okay. And it's by Rex Campbell. Great. I'll try and get hold of that. Well worth it. Now the really important things are gifts. Oh, don't worry about that. Just bring yourself. I know, <laughs> but I'd like to get something for your parents. What about Janice? I know she loves English tea. No,、oh, that's very kind, but she's not drinking so much of that these days. But she'd love some chocolate. You know her favorite. Oh yes, that'd be nice. I'll do that. And Alec, is he still into racing? <laughs> very much so. I was thinking of bringing a calendar, you know, with horse racing pictures. What a good idea! He'd love that. Great. So that's about it, I think. Yes, I think so. So you'll send me your number again. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You will hear a podcast on Camber's theme park. Now you have some time to look at questions eleven to sixteen. Now listen and answer questions eleven to sixteen. Welcome to Canvas Park podcast. In the next few minutes, I'll tell you a little about the park and the amazing things we have to offer. We like to think that Canvas offers more than other theme parks. Like them, we have a variety of exciting rides for people of all ages, but Canvas. Also places strong emphasis on the educational experience for its visitors, not boring facts, but lots of interactive exhibits. Although it's mainly an outdoor experience, we do have some indoor activities if the weather gets too dreadful. The park's got a lovely, well-established feel, set in eighty acres of beautiful countryside. About three miles south of the tourist resort of Dulcester, the park was set up in 1997 by the Camber family, but then taken over by new owners in 2004, who have maintained the original vision of the Cambers. It has lots of old trees, hundreds of flower beds, and a gorgeous lake. Cambers. Has over forty-five different rides, exhibits, and arcades. All but one of these is free once you've paid your entrance fee. We charge a small fee for our newest ride to reduce the length of the queues. You don't pay anything for parking. A family ticket for a family of four works out at about eight pounds per person, which is amazing value. Full details of current prices. Are shown on our website, along with full details of rides, etc., and directions for getting to us. We also have a number of special offers. For example, if you live locally, why not join our Adventurers Club, which entitles you to fifty percent off ticket prices all year round, and a special lane for all rides and exhibits, which means you don't have to wait to get into any part of the park. See the offers tab on the website. We've recently added a number of new exhibits to the park, 
and we're particularly proud of our future farm zone, which houses over 20 different species of animals, from chipmunks to dairy cows. The emphasis is on getting near to the animals. All of them can be petted, and you can buy food for feeding the animals. Many of our younger visitors say that this is the high point of their visit. And speaking of food, don't let the animals have all the fun. We have a total of seven different catering outlets on the site. We're open 10 to 5.30 all year round, and cold drinks and snacks can be bought at any time during opening hours. And hot food is available most of the day in the Hungry Horse Cafe from 11 until 5, just half an hour before closing time. Now you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Now we want all our visitors to have an exciting time when they come to the park, but our first priority must be safety. Parents and guardians know their children's behaviour and capabilities, but here at the park we have set certain conditions for each of the rides to ensure that all visitors get the maximum enjoyment out of the experience and feel secure at all times. There are four major rides at the park. Our newest ride is the River Adventure, which is designed to reproduce the experience of white water rafting. No amount of protective clothing would make any difference, so only go on this ride if you're prepared to get wet. Children under eight can go on this ride, but all under 16s must have an adult with them. Not all of our rides are designed for thrills and spills. Our Jungle Gym roller coaster is a gentler version of the classic Loop the Loop, specially created for whole family enjoyment, from the smallest children to elderly grandparents, suitable for all levels of disability and health conditions. Carriages have comfortable seating for up to eight people with safety belts for each passenger, which must be worn at all times. Sit back and enjoy the scenery. One of the best established and most popular of Camber's rides is the massive swoop slide. Whiz down the polished vertical slide, nine metres in height, and scream to your heart's content. There are no age or height restrictions. Be careful, though. You must have on long trousers so you won't get any speed burns. And then there's the famous Zip Go-Kart Stadium, with 16 carts, 8 for single drivers and 8 for kids preferring to ride along with mum, dad or carer. Take part in high-speed races in our specially designed Formula One-style carts, but no bumping other carts, please. All riders must be above 1.2 metres because they have to be able to reach the pedals, even in the shared carts. Full details of all safety features are available on our website at www.canvaspark.com. So come and make a day of it at Canvas Theme Park. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3 You will hear two geography students talking. An older student, called Howard, 
is giving advice to a younger student called Joanne on writing her dissertation. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 24. Hi, Howard. I haven't seen you for a while. Oh, hi, Joanne. Yeah, they're keeping us really busy on the postgraduate programme. Mm -hmm. But how are you? You'll be starting your dissertation soon, won't you? Yeah, tutorials start next week. I've got Dr Peterson. You'll remember it all from last year, of course. Oh, it's not something you forget easily. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, although I didn't expect to enjoy writing my dissertation, and in fact I didn't really find it much fun, mm. I wouldn't have missed the experience. I found it really improved my understanding of the whole degree programme, you know, from the first year on. Right. So what are you doing yours on? Glaciated landscapes, although I haven't decided exactly what aspect yet. Mm, I did mine on climate systems, so I can't help you much, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll be fine once you start your tutorials. Dr Peterson will help you focus. I know, and he'll set me deadlines for the different stages, which is what I need. My concern is that I've got tons of material on the topic and I won't be able to stick to the word limit, you know. Mm, I remember I had different concerns when I was doing my dissertation. Last year? Yeah, before my first tutorial I did a lot of fairly general reading because I hadn't fixed on my topic at that stage. Mm. I actually enjoyed that quite a lot and really improved my reading speed, you know, so I was getting through a lot of material. I was frightened I wouldn't remember it all, though, so I got into the habit of making very detailed notes. So, did you find your tutor helpful in getting you started? Yeah, we certainly had some interesting discussions, but it's funny, I saw a brilliant programme about climate change, and it was that that really fired me up. Oh. It was talking about some recent research which seemed to contradict some of the articles I'd been reading. Mm. Now you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. So you say your tutorials start next week? Yeah. Well, the first month's crucial. You've got to meet your tutor and decide on your focus, but don't become too dependent on him. You know, don't see him every week, only when you want to check something. Right. Once you've got the focus, you've got to get reading. Mm. It's helpful to look through the bibliographies for all the course modules relating to your topic and get hold of any books you think you'll need. I haven't got much money. I mean, get the books from the library. Far better. And I suppose I should prepare a detailed outline of the chapters? Yeah, absolutely. But don't feel you have to follow it slavishly. It's meant to be flexible. OK. Now, I'm someone who likes to get writing quickly. I can't just sit and read for a month. <laughs> Not like me, then. <laughs> <laughs> but if that's what suits you, you know, your natural approach, then you really ought to start immediately and write the first chapter. Right. Now, Joanne, about the library, mm. it's worthwhile getting on good terms with the staff. They aren't always helpful with undergraduates. I suppose they focus on postgrads more. Mm, maybe. But show them you're serious about wanting to do good work. And what if I can't find what I need? Well, there's interlibrary loans. 
borrowing books from other libraries, but I've heard it isn't all that reliable.、Mm, you're right, but you probably won't need it anyway. Be positive. <laughs> the library is likely to have most things you need. And during the dissertation writing period, you can take out fifteen instead of the usual ten books. Should I look at previous year's dissertations? You can do, but I won't know which are the good ones. The library only keeps the best, and the staff can advise you. Are they willing to do that? Oh yeah. And I'm worried about getting journal articles from the electronic library. Well, have you tried to find any yet? No. Well, you should. It's really straightforward. That's obviously something I'll have to look into. Doctor Peterson will help. Yeah, I know I can go to him if I have any worries. Except he will be away in the second month.、Oh. It's the holidays. You should ask him what to do while he's away. Gosh, yeah, but I suppose I can get a lot of support from coursemates. I know a couple of people who are thinking of doing the same topic as me. Take care. Collaboration can become dependency. I think you'd better see how that works out. What the people are like. You're probably right. About other reading, I suppose Dr. Peterson will recommend plenty of good articles to get me started. One thing I'd find out is what his attitude is to internet sources. Surely not in this day and age. I'd better get that sorted out right at the beginning. I would if I were you. And I've also got some questions about the research sections. How much time I should spend explaining the process? Well, I think that's up to you. You can see how it develops as you're writing. Okay. It's the same with things like time management. That's something a tutor can't really help you with. I agree. So, is there anything else you need me to go over? That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear a psychology undergraduate describing the research she is currently doing on expertise in creative writing. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen and answer questions thirty-one to forty. For my short presentation today, I'm going to summarise the work I've done so far on my research project to explore expertise in creative writing. Essentially, I'll share with you the process I underwent to gather my interim findings. First of all, I should give a little relevant background information about myself. Before I started my current degree course in cognitive psychology, I studied English literature, and as you can imagine, this meant I spent a great deal of time thinking about the notion of creativity and what makes people develop into successful writers. However, the idea for this research project came from a very specific source. I became fascinated with the idea of what makes an expert creative writer when I read a well-known 20th-century writer's autobiography. I won't say which one at this stage, because I think that might prejudice your interpretation. Anyway, this got me thinking about the different routes to expertise. Specifically, I wondered why some people become experts at things whilst others fail to do so. In spite of the fact that they may be equally gifted and work equally hard, I started to read about how other researchers had explored similar questions in other fields. I began to see a pattern: 
that those studies which involved research in a lab were too controlled for my purposes, and I decided to avoid reading them. I was quite surprised to find that the clearest guidance for my topic came from investigations into what I call practical skills, such as hairdressing or waiting tables. Most of these studies tended to use a similar set of procedures, which I eventually adopted for my own project. I'll now explain what these procedures were. I decided to compare what inexperienced writers do with what experienced writers do. In order to investigate this, I looked for four people whom I regarded as real novices in this field, which proved easy, perhaps unsurprisingly. It proved much harder to locate people with suitably extensive experience who were willing to take part in my study. I asked the first four to do a set writing task and, as they wrote, to talk into a tape recorder, a technique known as Think Aloud. This was in order to get experimental data. Whilst they were doing this, a research assistant recorded them using video. I thought it might be helpful for me in my transcriptions later on. I then asked four experienced writers to do exactly the same task. After this, I made a comparison between the two sets of data, and this helped me to produce a framework for analysis. In particular, I identified five major stages which all creative writers seem to go through when generating this genre of text. I think it was fairly effective, but still needs some work, so I intend to tighten this up later for use with subsequent data sets. I then wanted to see whether experienced writers were actually producing the better pieces of writing. So I asked an editor, an expert in reviewing creative writing, to decide which were the best pieces of writing. This person put the eight pieces of work in order of quality, in rank order, and using his evaluations, I was then able to work out which sequence of the five stages seemed to lead to the best quality writing. Now, my findings are by no means conclusive at this point. I still have a long way to go. But if any of you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them and go... That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.